so I've been involved in anti-war movements. I was involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement as a civilian before joining the military to be part of the resistance movement in the military. And then afterwards as a, as a veteran and I'm now involved as a veteran also. In, and we started a year ago, we started the uh, climate crisis and militarism uh, working group and now, now project within Veterans for Peace. So I think ending nuclear weapons is part of an over a bigger picture of ending war. Veterans for Peace has also has the uh, mission of abolishment, abolition of war. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we work together. And one thing we recognize the climate crisis and nuclear weapons are the two biggest uh, dangers in the world now. And um, we, my group has taken on um, climate crisis. One, one interesting thing we did was we've contacted John Kerry's office. So we started a letter and throughout March and April, we got endorsers. We got hundreds, hundreds of endorsers, US um, people of nationally recognized state and locally recognized um, international people. We got 350.org, the environmental group. We got Naomi Klein, we got Noam Chomsky. We got some pretty well-known people. We got 55 Veterans for Peace chapters. And we, um, we sent this letter to John Kerry's office and um, there are particular things we wanted. We wanted military emissions to be reported. Now, now, it's quite interesting that military greenhouse gas emissions are not reported. Now, this was due to the US um, in the Kyoto Protocol of 1997. They specifically pressured the conference to not report military emissions. And so then the US didn't even ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So, so we're faced with a situation where they, they we can't get the information on it. We really have to dig. It's not in the public domain. People don't know about it. It's very hard to find. So military emissions, the, the military greenhouse gas effect, their carbon footprint, their carbon bootprint just sort of gets uh, not noticed. Now, the US has 800 military bases overseas. What the hell does it do with 800 military bases? Um, there's a problem that even anti-war people use the term defense spending, but this has nothing to do with defense. This has to do with imperialism. These bases protect corporate power, extracting materials and labor from the global South, from parts of the world. So there's this part of military emissions that are not reported. Now we talked to John Kerry's office and they told us, they, they said, oh, these, the emissions from these 800 bases are the responsibility of the countries where they're located. Well, the people of these countries don't want these bases in many cases. So that the things we focus on in our group are carbon footprint of the military is one thing. And we're not just counting um, jet, you know, jet exhaust and uh, ship exhaust and what happens on US bases. And then we're trying to get what happens on these overseas bases of the US, but then what, what, what about the manufacturing of military hardware and weapons? That's, that's another huge carbon footprint, the transportation of these things. So we want all that stuff to be counted. So this is what we're, this is what we're trying to do. So, so there's the carbon footprint, there's the mission. The mission of the military contributes to the climate crisis in a huge way because the mission is supporting the fossil fuel status quo. And then another, another thing we want to focus on is, is racism and classism, um, where poor people, people of color, get the brunt of both the climate crisis and militarism. And, and some of that, you can see some of that in refugees. They're refugees from the climate crisis and they're refugees from wars. Now, there are gonna be increasing refugees from the climate crisis and militarism is going to try to stop them. You know, set up, set up walls, set up borders uh, to stop people from, 
from entering. So um, another thing about racism is the military, um, not everybody sees it as a terribly racist institution, but if you're in there, you'll, you'll know that they trained us to be racist. So they have to inculcate racism into soldiers in particular, but they do it into the population at large in a little less direct way. So those, those four things we really uh, focus on in, the, in, this, in our group, the, uh, the carbon blueprint, the mission of the military, the, the huge financial drain that this is causing and um, racism and classism. Every issue needs to be connected. The climate needs to be connected with nuclear. We need to connect with all kinds of things. I'm a retired union member. I'm involved in labor and climate issues too. That's a big issue here in the United States of trying to, partly trying to get labor on board with climate, with climate issues and, and hopefully with war issues too. Um, but we're sort of, we're kind of starting with the climate issues. Uh, it's, it's happening some, it's been slow. It needs work on both ends because some of the work from the environmental community has not been sufficiently uh, taking into account the situation that workers find themselves in. And the unions have been reluctant in many cases, but some of that's moving on. These, these issues, everything has to come together. <laughs> there has to be, there has to be a, a worldwide movement for everything, for justice in every way, climate justice, uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons, um, ending poverty, uh, global health, global health system that can deal with pandemics and can deal with prevention of further pandemics by smart things and cooperation. Everybody's working on their areas. Your, your group is working on nuclear areas. We just, we have to think broadly of how, in every case, we have to think of how we can build connection you know, how we can, how we can reach out, how we can, how we can join issues without compromise. You know, we can be radical, but we need a big tent. We need a really big tent, but we don't have to compromise our, uh, our critiques. We don't have to, we don't have to not talk about imperialism, for example, but we need to, we need to do that. Another thing I think is really important is kind of the inter, interpersonal, um, sort of the way that we all need to take care of ourselves as we do this work. It's that we do, we're doing important social action work, it's crucial. And then at the same time, we have to attend to our health, we have to attend to our personal lives, we have to find the joy in our life. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to save a world, a, a beautiful planet. And we have, to, we have to enjoy the beauty of that planet as well as, as, well as do our work. And we have to, we have to be good to each other. It's so easy for, for attacks to occur. Uh, in the sectarian left, that occurs. I've been there. Uh, we don't need that. But we do need the radical critique. We do need that. But we need, we need support for people. And, and, and we also have to recognize that it's not, in most cases, it's not a lack of facts that holds people back or keeps people from sort of embracing what really makes sense. It makes sense to get rid of nuclear weapons. It makes sense to address the climate crisis. But these are, for one thing, these are hard things to look at. You know, the, it's, hard to, it's hard to face nuclear war. It's hard to face the fact that this, we have uh, governments that are armed to the teeth. It's hard to face the fact that the, you know, corporations are, are greedy and willing to do whatever it is for their bottom line, for their profit, even if it destroys our species and many species. We've been hurt emotionally a lot. That's that's the common situation, and and we have to we have to heal from that. We have to listen to each other well. We have to we have to understand that that there are these things in the way for us and for other people that uh, make it so we don't look at things rationally. It's hard to look at the cooperative uh, possibilities that we have or the need we have to to. to to cooperate in order to survive, you know, that, that, that's, what, that's what we have to do.